What is the current guidance for using basal insulin in patients with type 2 diabetes? In this first episode of Increasing Options to Improve Outcomes, examining the role of once-weekly basal insulin formulations, Dr. Athena phyllis Simikas shares the latest clinical data and considerations for use. Access the full series and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash KNZ 860. We know that poorly controlled diabetes can lead to increased risk of developing diabetes-related complications. These can be both microvascular as well as macrovascular. On the microvascular side, diabetic retinopathy and diabetic neuropathy can be seen as well as nephropathy. It's important to check for these on a routine basis with annual eye exams as well as urine microalbumin or urine albumin testing. On the macrovascular side, cardiovascular disease with an increased incidence of coronary disease, stroke, and peripheral artery disease, as well as congestive heart failure can many times be seen and can occur two to three times more frequently in patients with diabetes. We also know that diabetes-related complications of both micro and macrovascular can be reduced as you improve glycemic control, and this was shown in several large-scale randomized control studies in type 2 diabetes, such as UKPDS very early on and later on with Accord, Advance, and VADT. All of the large societies currently have treatment recommendations for use of basal insulin in patients with type 2 diabetes. You can use basal insulin in virtually any patient who's not at goal. The ADA's recommendations are to start insulin therapy if someone's A1C is above 10%, if they are in a catabolic state, if they have symptoms of hyperglycemia, for example, polyuria, polydipsia. And this may be seen many times in patients that have had longer duration of diabetes, usually over 10, 15 years. Both ACE and ENDO have similar recommendations, although the Endocrine Society does make an emphasis on being careful with patients that are older in age and adjusting your target for hemoglobin A1c according to what the patient might tolerate and consider maybe having a slightly higher A1c for patients that are over 65, 70 years old. When might you consider initiating basal insulin? You might think about it in patients that have an A1C that is above their individualized target, and they're already on max-tolerated non-insulin agents. Those can be both oral and non-insulin injectable agents. They might have a new diagnosis with an A1C above 8.5 or 9%. As their condition improves, They may be able, and they overcome their beta cell toxicity and glucotoxicity, you may be able to transition them over to orals or non-insulin agents, but certainly starting out with insulin in a higher range of A1C is appropriate. If there's any sign of metabolic decompensation or end organ failure, this might be another trigger to start using insulin. Someone with acute illness that's progressing and not improving Prolonged use of steroids is another condition we might see which would require insulin, and usually you might want to think about either NPH insulin in this case or one of the newer generation insulins, and anyone that might have an intolerance to oral medications. The time to maybe think about not initiating insulin would be in older patients, asymptomatic patients, or those that have a higher risk for hypoglycemia and may not be cognitively able to distinguish the signs of hypoglycemia. In one study done by Kamblesh Kunti that looked at the consequences of delaying treatment intensifications in people with type 2 diabetes that previously did not have any cardiovascular disease, what they found was that at 5.3 years, there was a significantly increased risk of cardiovascular disease if you delayed the initiation of insulin. So in patients that had a starting A1C above 7% after six months of a type 2 diagnosis, if they did not receive insulin therapy within one year of diagnosis, they went on to have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease in the subsequent five years approximately. There are a number of different basal insulins that can be used for initiation of insulin. These run the gamut from human NPH, which usually needs to be used either once at bedtime or BID twice a day for treatment, 
First-generation insulin, basal insulin, such as Detamir and Glargine, sometimes had a somewhat shorter half-life and might not extend the entire 24-hour time period and occasionally needed to be used twice a day. The newer generation insulin, such as Glargine U300 and insulin Degludec, had a much longer half-life, able to last the full 24 hours and able to use these once, truly once daily. Several studies have been done with both Glargine U300 as well as Degludec that showed fewer episodes of hypoglycemia when using these agents compared to more traditional older insulin such as Glargine U100. Looking at the cases that were presented today, for all the reasons that I just discussed, case number two here really is the best case for starting basal insulin. This is your 52-year-old patient with a moderate history of type 2 diabetes, seven years, with an A1C of 8.1%, who is currently on two oral agents but experiencing weight loss, which may be associated with some catabolic state. We don't know if he has polyuria or any other catabolic type symptoms, but this would really be someone that you might want to start basal insulin, improve the situation, and then consider at that point if anything else needs to be changed. So the other cases, although some may end up needing insulin, are less optimal in terms of being the best candidate for basal insulin therapy at this time. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash KNZ860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Novo Nordisk Incorporated.